Welcome back, fellow soldiers, to Appropriating the Culture in another edition of Tackling Hot Topics. Hot Topics! On the docket today is Capital Punishment, and there's a lot to cover, so put down that last meal, walk the green mile with me, and let's put to death some wrong-headed notions on the rightness of state killing. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your execution... I'll be your... According to Gallup, support for the death penalty in America has been declining over the past 20 years, and many Christians, particularly our Catholic brothers and sisters, have soured on capital punishment, and many others are in need of clear thinking on this issue. Now there is nuance, and there is some degree of valid debate about this issue, but the first thing we need to recognize when we're tackling this hot topic, hot topic. is that you cannot believe in the Christian God and also believe that the death penalty is intrinsically immoral. Those are two thoughts that do not go great together. It's basically the antithesis of a Reese's peanut butter cup. Because the Christian idea of God is that he is the moral standard. He is goodness incarnate. He is holiness manifested. He is perfectly righteous, perfectly just, perfectly good, and he is incapable of doing anything immoral. And what is abundantly clear in scripture is that this perfectly good being is perfectly fine with the death penalty, at least in some contexts. He institutes it in the nation of Israel, Leviticus. Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Now, some will say, well, Leviticus doesn't apply to us. We ignore most of it because it also says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. We don't put to death people who commit adultery. It's not even a crime in our society. Though maybe it should be. There's also a death penalty in Levitical law for homosexual offenders, for bestiality, and even for gathering sticks on the Sabbath. That's not a euphemism for anything. That's literal. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody because it was not clear what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord commanded Moses. Boy, is he strict. We don't execute people for violating the Sabbath. Many people don't even recognize the Sabbath. A lot of Christians think the Sabbath is Sunday. It's not. So there's a couple of things that we need to recognize here. Number one, yes, not everything in the Levitical law applies to us. God in this time of human history under the Mosaic Covenant has set apart the Israelites to be his people. And so he is acting not just as God, but also as their king. And as king, he institutes laws that correspond to the moral law as well as cultural conventions. Every single society and nation and government has both. We have laws against murder, and murder is a violation of the moral law. It is wrong for all people, in all times, in all places. But we also have laws that are cultural conventions, things that are not violations of the universal or moral law, like the rules of traffic. The rules of traffic vary from place to place. Some drive on the left, some drive on the right, and it changes over time. Speed limit goes up, speed limit goes down. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't a moral component to obeying cultural conventions or no consequence for violating cultural conventions. There are. The tax code is a cultural convention. It varies from place to place, and it changes over time. What was illegal one moment can be perfectly legal the next. But it's still wrong to violate the tax code, and if you do, you can wind up in jail. Just ask Capone. So yes, if you gather firewood on the Sabbath, you pay the penalty for violating the law of the land. But if I gather firewood on the Sabbath, nothing happens to me, because I'm not under the Mosaic Covenant, and it doesn't apply. But how do we distinguish between cultural conventions and moral universal laws? Well, the funny thing is, the Bible is actually quite helpful with that. Let's just take a look at the Sabbath. It says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master's servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Colossians, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. 
Does that sound like a universal law to you? So let's turn it back now to the death penalty. When people, particularly Christians, say that the death penalty is wrong, what do they mean by that? Is the death penalty a violation of the moral law? Is it wrong for all people at all times and all places? No, clearly not, because God institutes it in at least one context. So you cannot believe in the Christian God and simultaneously hold to the notion that the death penalty is intrinsically or inherently wrong. God cannot violate the moral law, and cultural conventions are, by definition, not objectively wrong. But that doesn't mean that the death penalty is required. And that's the second thing that we see in the Levitical law. Adultery is a violation of the transcendent universal moral law, but the punishment of that law in society is cultural. Some countries do have laws on the books about adultery. Some countries, like ours, do not. So the punitive action against violating even the moral law is cultural, and for some good reason. The goal of our laws is to produce a more righteous and just society, but the efficacy of those laws is relative to the cultural conditions. What on earth does that mean? Well, let's think of it this way. In principle, I'm not against the death penalty for adultery. How could I be? God was okay with it. But if it were on the ballot in our country, would I vote for it? Mm, probably not. Not because I'm in favor of adultery. I'm not. But because I think that in our culture, a law such as that would probably produce an increase in divorce and an even bigger increase of people shacking up and never getting married. So while the law would likely reduce adultery, however, rather than strengthening marriage, it would probably weaken it, and that would be worse for our society. So, given the cultural conditions, such a law would produce a less righteous and less just society. The goal of our laws is to produce a more righteous and just society, but the efficacy of those laws is relative to the cultural conditions. Make sense? Now, if you wanted to also outlaw divorce and premarital sex while you're at it, well, then now you have my attention. But if our society were actually in favor of that, then we're dealing with very different cultural conditions. Unfortunately, benevolent theocracies are out of vogue. But if you would like to vote for me as your benevolent dictator, I would humbly accept. In fact, our sponsor today is brought to you by my campaign for Supreme Ultimate Benevolent Dictator of the United States in Puerto Rico. Write to your congressman and support a constitutional amendment to instate me as your moral and social authoritarian leader for all time. We're in California. What do you got to lose? Though I can't guarantee that all actions will be benevolent. There are trade-offs. Earthly justice systems are not perfect, and sometimes our laws are an expression of prudence. Take Proposition 47, which passed in California in 2014 and was supported by the state Democratic Party and by the American Civil Liberties Union. The idea behind it was to reduce certain nonviolent felonies to misdemeanors in order to free up resources for cops and prosecutors to focus on violent offenders. Which, okay could make sense. You could see how that might produce a more righteous and just society. But here's the actual effect. Yep, just, just stealing things. Got a big old sack full of stolen goods. Oh, and there he goes. That was in San Francisco, which has seen the largest uptick in petty crime in any U.S. city. Larceny, vandalism, burglary, shoplifting, if it's not grand theft, are low priorities and misdemeanors. Rachel Michelin, president of the California Retailers Association, said, They know what they're doing. They will bring in calculators and get all the way up to the $950 limit. One person will go into a store, fill up their backpack, come out, dump it out, and go right back in and do it all over again. Prop 47 is not exactly a law that is producing a more righteous and just society. It can be prudent to be more lenient, like in the case of adultery, and it can be prudent to be more strict, like in the case of petty crimes, in order to produce a more righteous and just system, which is the goal of our laws. In terms of the death penalty, as we've seen, there is nothing intrinsically morally wrong with it. So the only question left to consider is whether or not its use in our culture for heinous crimes produces a more just and righteous society or not. Well, I'm not going to answer that question. Cliffhanger ending. 
You'll have to tune in next week where I'll address the best and worst, brightest and dumbest arguments against the death penalty and solidify my position as the best candidate for supreme ultimate benevolent dictator of the United States and Puerto Rico. But to start the thought process, I want you to consider Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. That is a statement that is not from the Levitical law. It predates Levi. It's not from the Mosaic Covenant. It predates Moses. The justification for capital punishment in that text is the Imago Dei, the image of God. But all of mankind is made in the image of God, so is the death penalty really a cultural issue? Are the numerous nations that don't have the death penalty sinning when they don't execute murderers? Cliffhanger ending. Let me know what you think. Leave a comment on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Locals, or all of them, and I'll see you back here for the exciting finale.